Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Van Sale. And tonight we're not going to be shining a light on the goings on down south, but rather again uh, what's going on a bit more west uh, towards the United States. And maybe in, even widen that lens a little bit to the world and uh, what's going on uh, uh, in the on the global stage. So tonight to join me for this conversation will be uh, the Prudentialist. He is a political commentator on YouTube, uh, mainly focused on matters of culture and history. And he also does excellent analysis on uh, contemporary events. So we will be getting into quite a few topics that I think are quite relevant. Um, so you can just sit tight and relax. Uh, welcome to this, uh, the show, Prudentialist. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Mm. No, I quite enjoy your content, so it's uh, nice to have a, a, a live chat with you to maybe flesh out some of the ideas that I've seen come to the fore on your channel. Um, and maybe before we begin, uh, I would just like to remind everyone listening, uh, if you would like to get uh, updates of when my streams start, uh, there's a Telegram link in the description. You can go check it out. Um, so something that I think will pretty much set the stage and lay the foundation for tonight's discussion is an idea that it's a concept that I haven't heard for a long while, but it is gaining traction. And that's the idea of woke capital. Uh, you've made videos explicitly referring to it. And a lot of people uh, that you and I subscribe to also have uh, started using the term. Um, maybe to lay the foundation, could you give us an, a conception, almost like explain it to me like I'm five in regards to what woke capital is? So to me, woke capital is this shedding of an apolitical skin of a, of a company. If it's a company with a regional, national, and mainly international level of branding and marketing that takes a stance on a particular social issue, normally in a progressive stance. But it, to me, it is the aspect of a company utilizing its reach and power to socially engineer and change perspectives of its consumers. Mm. And, uh, in regards to your experience, is this a, a recent phenomenon or is it something that has been building up and been developing and coming to the fore uh, much longer than maybe the past, let's say, five or uh, even decade? To me, I think it is something that's been going on a lot longer. I mean, all companies have the ability to change perspectives, especially in the advent of mass media through television since the 1950s. We've had the culture influenced by what gets put out there. Now, the ability, and as I've analyzed that what's changed in say the last 10 to 15 years is a more emphasized focus on, uh, you know, diverse representation in terms of the United States, in terms of demographics, which in turn gets expounded throughout the rest of the globe because the United States is still a large cultural exporter of cultural capital. And, what they can do with this is that it doesn't matter if someone you know disagrees with the messaging because you can in the long run change the perspectives of the next generation of consumers to almost have a very depraved almost skinner box situation where these people will purchase at the first sign of a virtue signal so that's what i've said in my work and others as well that you know the phrase go woke go broke is very much a coping mechanism mm. And uh, that's something, I mean, what you're describing there is pretty much uh, to put it in layman's terms or to really uh, reduce it is pretty much when you see uh, Burger King putting uh, a rainbow flag on their profile picture, um, uh, Microsoft tweeting out that uh, we need to protect the integrity of democracy. When you see um, uh, Apple or someone uh, or a, a similar company putting out a Black Lives Matter post on social media that's pretty much uh, what you're describing here but when you mention uh, get woke go broke i mean that used to be a very zingy term that uh, people used to throw around it used to get a lot of reaction in regards to people saying yeah that's very much the case but i can't agree more in regards to what i'm seeing around me um, these companies don't seem to be only motivated by profits uh, you can see uh, companies making negative decisions in regard in a, in a profit sense, but uh, in regards to an ideology or in regards to uh, virtue signaling, uh, for a lack of a better term, uh, it seems to be the right choice. And uh, people may say 
that uh, oh, we just need to uh, boycott these companies, then they'll uh, pretty much uh, get back to being non-political. But uh, I don't think that's one of the main drivers. I think there's a lot more going on. It's not just profits. Uh, if you're looking at some of the bizarre decisions made by some of these companies, I, ve- I think nowhere more is it more evident than in Hollywood in regards to films where they're making they're pretty much destroying franchises with ideology. Um, So maybe if you can also share your thoughts and uh, expand a little bit on uh, your problem with that term of uh, go and go woke, go broke. Sure. So uh, to me, I think phrases that are meant to placate or to reassure us, uh, you'll you'll see all sorts of commentators and channels, whether they talk about pop culture, they're more culturally oriented. You do hear a lot of people saying, oh, you you know, the phrase, go woke, go broke, and then they never do anything about it. To me, a phrase like that, not only is it cope, but it kind of prevents you from taking action. It's almost as if it's a digital bystander effect. You'll watch it happen on its own. You'll just stand there on the sidelines. And I think that that's been incredibly negative for individuals who are engaged politically as well as in the culture war online as well as on the ground but um in hollywood as well as with other things they might make these decisions that we consider backward but it's also done to placate the left as much as it does to you know create another generation of consumers because the left does have some valid critiques and uh, objections to things like capitalism to objections to the marketplace in the same way that the right has objections to the marketplace, whether you're someone who believes in Karl Marx or G.K. Chesterton. But the way that woke capital has gone about it is that you have managed to take these issues that the left has socially when it comes to certain issues, whether it's racial issues, class issues, and create these fake artificial you know, ways of solving the problem. So whether it's the black square that these companies tweet out with Black Lives Matter, whether it's the Oreo cookie company tweeting about transgender rights, it's done in a way to placate the left while at the same time still keeping these you know, rich, powerful financiers in power. Mm. Uh, it's funny uh, uh, that you say it uh, pretty much benefits the elites because uh, they talk about uh, transformation and uh, diversity, but their boardrooms don't seem to be very diverse. Um, in South Africa, uh, you see uh, a lot of companies copying this type of um, woke messaging as well, um, which I find funny. And the, the thing is, again, this theme uh, constantly comes to the fore that it can't just be about profit. It can't just be about uh, this is the the new hip thing that the kids are saying, therefore we need to do it. There does seem to be a, a different element to it because, I mean, it's clear as day that uh, in a Ceteris uh, Paribus sense, uh, get woke, go broke should actually make sense. Uh, and it should be pushing the companies uh, towards pretty much uh, abandoning a lot of these ideolo- bizarre ideological stances. But they keep doubling down. It's not like they are backing down or really saying, OK, maybe uh, we've misjudged this. Uh, it's not like they just tried uh, a woke ad campaign. It didn't quite work uh, in regards to profits. And then they pretty much go back to business as usual. It seems to be escalating, uh, but it's it can't be escalating just because the, the profits are going up. Because then you look uh, again to use the example of Hollywood films and franchises. Um, it doesn't seem to be doing a lot of financial uh, uh, financial success for them. You can just look at uh, the Star Wars franchise. Um, you can look at uh, franchises where uh, it, they have this immense uh, consumer base, and the consumer, and you can see it in gaming as well. With, uh, for example, The Last of Us Two, um, the ideological approach that these companies took definitely had a negative effect on their their profit margins, but they don't seem to care. Well, they don't seem to care in part because you, it's a way to generate more attention. It's uh, almost an outrage culture that you can foster and facilitate because more people talk about it, the more articles that get written about it, the more clicks that happen, the more ad revenue that comes in through it. It's a really insidious racket of you know destroying and debasing things that had such a long-standing cultural impact and the cultural zeitgeist in the U.S. or in other parts of the world. And now you can make your money by simply you know talking about how terrible the latest you know installment of The Last of Us Part Two was, because even though they may not like it, you're going to have your supporters virtue signal on your behalf, harass others for it, write articles about it, and the money keeps on flowing. It's one heck of a racket. Mm. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, something else that I also find interesting is something I've noticed. So back in the day, um, in the more uh, traditional or original sense of the culture war, uh, you you got to, uh, jokes like, oh, where are all these uh, bachelor's degree students that studied all these bizarre uh, degrees going to get jobs? Well, they're getting jobs and they, they've pretty much been quite ingenious in how they're getting jobs. So uh, you always thought like, where's the, where are all these people that are getting degrees in diversity studies and gender studies going to get jobs? Well, uh, they figured out that if you just get corporations to buy into your ideology, they're going to pretty much hire you to make sure that they are ideologically pure. So uh, if you generate enough outrage, these corporations are going to hire you almost as an extortion uh, tactic to make sure that, well, uh, you pretty much tell them, uh, I see you've got a, a quote unquote racism problem at your company. Well, I've got a degree in diversity studies. Uh, let me take care of that problem for you. Give me a job. I'll make sure everything is fine and the attack dogs are off your, are off your back. Um, have you noticed this as well? Oh, definitely. And you can see this ranging from everyone from Dr. Kendi to Anita Sarkeesian when they are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as in consulting fees. I mean, you mentioned The Last of Us Part Two. I mean, Neil Druckmann himself from Naughty Dog had mentioned that he had brought um, Anita Sarkeesian on as a consultant to talk about the narrative of the game and how to pursue a more inclusive and feminist story. And uh, Dr. Kendi himself is, you know, not only is he making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year warning companies about racism and white supremacy inside to their companies, but he's also starting up a newspaper again. I was just reading earlier today. He's trying to bring back an old antebellum era, you know, anti-slavery newspaper to talk about racial justice issues here in the United States. So it is very much a, a way of identifying and keeping people to, it's almost like paying the mafia protection money. Mm. And uh, I think a, a theme that's coming to the fore is the fact that uh, a lot of the, you know, for a lack of a better word, uh, a lot of the memes are from the previous incarnation of the culture war just don't uh, line up with reality anymore. They've been proven wrong, basically. So ideas like get woke, go broke, uh, where are all these uh, students or all these uh, bizarre degrees going to get jobs? All these types of ideas uh, or these memes uh, don't really correlate with reality. It seems like, as you said earlier, it's just a major cope at this point. Well, not even well, a, a cope as well as the opportunity to sort of keep any sort of potential opposition from acting. You know, we, we talk about, you know, where are all these people with these, you know, degrees and gender studies and, you know, human resource specialists? Well, where are they going to get jobs? It's not how the real economy works. And it doesn't matter what you think the real economy is. These people are going to transform the economy to suit their needs. And that's exactly what we've seen. Some of the greatest growth in, say, you know, higher education in the United States in the last 25 years has been in administrative roles. It hasn't been in actual teaching or professorships or tenure tracks. So we're seeing the, a radical transformation of the economy from actual producers to these administrative specialist in HR generalist kind of classes. Mm. Actually, uh, a little bit of a resemblance to the Soviet Union there, uh, not to beat a, a dead horse or to make that comparison, but I mean, it's uh, it's pretty much obvious. Um, but you mentioned something there that I really want to talk about, and you talked about uh, it neutralizes opposition. Now, one of the main oppositions that we got uh, to this type of uh, critical theory uh, back in the day, in I mean, again, for a lack of a better term, the previous incarnation of the culture war, um, you pretty much got the, the libertarian or classical liberal uh, approach to it. It's pretty much uh, as long as the government is, isn't oppressing people, it's fine. Uh, private companies can do what they want. If you don't like what Twitter is doing, build your own Twitter. If you don't like uh, what the internet uh, is going on with the internet, just build your own internet. If you don't like the policies of your bank, start your own bank. Uh, that's pretty much where we're going. And it's actually... A quite ingenious way to uh, keep to protect the status quo while pretending to be opposed to it when you take the stance of our oh, private companies can do what they want because then you get to that point where we're now at a point where private companies have uh, are as large as states in regards to their their capital uh, we have companies that get more revenue than gdp of many major countries 
Um, and at that point, it's very hard to just say, well, uh, just create your own op opposing company. Uh, the free market will protect you. Um, and it is a controversial debate that's uh, becoming more and more relevant, in my opinion, in regards to uh, these abuses we are seeing from the corporate side rather than the, the state side. It's almost as if we're, we're still trapped in an old paradigm of looking at uh, oppression only coming from the state rather than a massive mind-blowingly large corporations and i think that we are seeing that transformation or that transition away from the older paradigm of the culture war because is the the classical liberals those who, who claim to be you know they seem to focus incredibly more on the state and the state sponsoring these ideas so you'll see a lot of prominent quote unquote classical liberals and they'll focus on things like critical race theory and critical theory but they'll focus on it and say education areas in which the government has control and they'll occasionally talk about these companies but they're not addressing the fact that the free market i think to a lot of us but whether you're on the left or on the right of that issue is very much this myth of neutrality that we hold up these companies work in tandem these companies work together in terms of keeping the narrative and moving in it one direction and maybe that's me buying more so into the neo-reactionary side of political philosophy but i think that it's a telling when you know, every company has the black square for Black Lives Matter. Every company has the rainbow flag during Pride Month yeah, in June. When, when a person is banned from Twitter, they, in a matter of minutes or hours, they're banned from YouTube and Facebook as well. Exactly. And then they're blacklisted for Google searches. The YouTube algorithm won't show their videos. It's it, They work in tandem. It's a manipulation of procedural results to get the outcome that they want. So when they're saying, well, just build your own Twitter, build your own internet, you are advocating for essentially in, in a cultural and, you know, political separation from, you know, the, these entities, these states. Yeah, because the thing is, when you, quote unquote, build your own internet, uh, the old internet's not, not going to stop existing. It's still going to be there. You're just creating, well, it's hard to really wrap your head around it because we haven't really been able to conceptualize this idea of two internets, even though there are countries with their own version of it. But it isn't really a solution, in my opinion. It's pretty much a, a pipe dream. But at the same time, I do am a, I am a strong advocate of parallelism in regards to building your own institutions. That's possible, but not by uh, a top-down approach, but rather from a grassroots communal approach. Where, for example, in South Africa, where we are building our own universities and uh, our own technical colleges now, not with uh, billionaire money or with uh, money from the state, but from crowds uh, or from grassroots level money, uh, crowdsourcing it basically. But at the same time, that's not as uh, as glamorous as pretty much the the argument that either corporation, uh, private entities can do what they want, just uh, build a better company and you'll be able to compete. Uh, or the classical liberal uh, argument of uh, just fight bad ideas with good ideas. I, I agree with you. They, they've made it to the, the idea that you can have these glamorous titans of industry be beaten by the little guy when, you know, how is a little guy able to compete when Google won't host, you know, ad services or revenue? They control 80% of all internet searches. It's virtually impossible to go up against what is pretty much a global monopoly. Yeah. Let's, but, let's be honest. Google at this point is the internet. To a it, very it, it is. And to say otherwise would be foolhardy at best mm. it's a it is very interesting when you look at it from that angle because that's what uh, the the previous incarnations of, of arguments from quote unquote our side have been it's just just fight uh, good ideas with bad ideas but then you get to a point where the good you're putting the best of the best the cream of the crop of your ideas out there but they're just being squashed because you can't get them out there the 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 very idea of the public square has been monopolized. I mean, let's be honest, social media is the new public square, and that has been completely monopolized. Um, in regards to, I mean, there's another classic argument that I remember from the previous incarnation of the culture war, and that's the argument that, oh, but remember, MySpace uh, was once a monopoly or a, a, a big player, now they're gone. Uh, Blackberry was once a big company, and now they're gone. I I might be naive in this, but I can't see a company the size of Google pretty much becoming a thing of the past. It's not that I don't see it being possible. It's the 
I would find it incredibly hard for something to replace it. Uh, a company can make bad decisions, and even a company as large as Google is, in theory, could you know collapse or make oh, cool. faulty decisions. But I think the the matter is is that when people make those arguments, right, they, they forget that MySpace had actual competition, and they had Facebook, they had Twitter to deal with, they had the advent of YouTube and other social media, and they fell by the wayside due to their poor decisions. There's no way in the current system that we have that Google is going to allow a competitor to rise up to that level. We are not in a position where these companies that we see right now are going to fall by the wayside because they have the power to control who falls on the wayside. Just look at what's happening to Gab and what happened to Paula. Exactly. The, the, it's the most prominent example. And even though Gab is still going on, I think Mr. Torba's got his own demons to fight on that's not a poke at his religious you know posts and exposition but it's difficult to fight uh what is very much an uphill battle it almost feels like the curse of sisyphus trying to push that boulder up the hill yeah uh but now that we've uh, pretty much assessed the situation uh quite bleakly um i think i'd like to to get into maybe even uh, from a more personal angle uh where have you found uh what type of ideas have recently um come to the fore in in your personal life that you think might hold a uh, key to our salvation or our solution in the future so i'm very much with you on the idea that things are going to have to happen locally and since i've started doing the commentary thing on youtube i've always been adamant that the current incarnation of the culture war is a two-front conflict. You are going to need a group of people that are willing to go out and about to build their own institutions, both online and on the ground, whether that's communities, schools, churches, child care facilities, whatever it may be that your community needs in order to survive. But you're also going to need a second crowd and a second organization of people that are willing to fight the current culture war as we know it within the current school system, within our current forms of government, elections, and the avenues of the popular culture. Because you cannot succeed with without the other. The people that are trying to build the institutions are going to need the other crowd of people to push back in order to fight back so these people don't get canceled so they can still have their payment processors and banks accept their money. While at the same time, the people building those institutions are going to need to you know, use those institutions to recruit the next generation of people to fight the ongoing culture war. Without having one or the other, I think that our ability to fight back against our current problem, which I think we've accurately identified as woke techno-capital, without both of them, I think that our cause is lost. Mm. Well, uh, the other thing that I think is very important, and you described it there where you said uh, you need to create the parallel uh, fields of battle, but you still need to remain on the old ones. Again, to use the example of social media, I've been telling people for so long that don't delete, if you're not suspended or banned from these mainstream social media sites, don't delete your Twitter account, don't delete your YouTube channel, don't delete... Um, or whatever uh, you're using or whatever mainstream media ugh, mainstream platform you're using because that is also a field of battle if you retreat there you're pretty much just giving our opponents all the ground and they don't even have to fight for it what people need to remember is that the vast absolute vast if not all uh, of the normies are still on the mainstream platforms and uh, there are a lot of people there that can still be saved a lot of people that could still be exposed to interesting stimulating ideas that will make them view the world a bit differently uh, i mean i can only talk from my own personal experience but i was also a normie once um, and i don't think abandoning these mainstream platforms is a very uh, good uh, decision in the long term you're pretty much seeding ground that you don't have to see Exactly. Never, never cede ground to the enemy when you don't need to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're being constantly banned from all these uh, platforms and you can't really build a following there, that's fine. I mean, the alternative tech is there. But I don't see alternative tech uh, pretty much being the future in regards to everyone just moving there. Because uh, the problem then is, uh, and this is actually something I also wanted to get your thoughts on, the problem that we're facing is that when we start siloing, siloing ourselves off on these alt tech and alternative platforms, well, everyone there, you're just preaching to the choir. Uh, all the types of debates you're going to have there, all the types of discussions you're going to have there is going to be within a very restricted Overton window. 
um, on the mainstream platforms, you can interact with any type of person from any type of uh, ideological background or viewpoint. And there's still a lot of uh, interesting discussions and debates to be had there and a lot of people to be reached through sharing your content, creating content, uh, responding to uh, a lot of things going on around you. And I think to just retreat into uh, little silos and, and uh, pretty much just spending the rest of your days preaching to the choir or preaching to the converted, I think would be a grave mistake. I agree. And I do think it's important to diversify your, you know, your, um, you know, platforms online. If you want to use alt tech, you should use alt tech concurrently next to your own, uh, you know, platforms on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube, as well as, you know, Gab and BitChute and others. But there, it's important for us to go out of the way to actually reach out to those that could potentially be on our side and potentially feel as if they're disillusioned with the current state of affairs. Because I don't think we've reached a plateau of, you know, converting people or making them aware that, you know, there are communities out there that are willing to support you and build something better. No, uh, that is one of the, the ideas within our uh, if within our sphere of ideas that I can't uh, really say I agree with the idea that uh, the red pilling has plateaued. I think there's still a lot of potential specifically, and I'm speaking from experience in South Africa. In South Africa, there's so much potential in regards to uh, telling people about ideas that they've never heard about, uh, giving them uh, perspectives and angles that they've never even considered. I can see it right now because South African culture is on a bit of a lag uh, with American culture. So whereas American culture is currently debating or the culture war online is pretty much between mainstream social media and uh, alternative social media, in South Africa, the, alter the mainstream social media commentator scene has just only now started in regards to content creation. Um, I think you'll know what I'm talking about when I talk about the like the podcast era or the podcast scene uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. That's pretty much starting just now in South Africa. And I think uh, that's a great example of pretty much uh, there not being a plateau. There's actually still a lot of people to be reached, a lot of people uh, that find a lot of value uh, in this new uh, emerging arena in the South African context. And I think that's also applicable to a lot of other countries. I would agree. And the fact that these, you know, communities are beginning to just finally emerge in other parts of the world, whether it's in South Africa or even to take our most prominent culture warrior example, that of, you know, Carl Benjamin, who's got his podcast in the UK, which has gone off quite well in terms of its ratings and its viewership, that it, we are not yet done and reaching out to other people and we cannot give up. Mm, absolutely. Uh, but now that you mentioned not giving up, uh, I think a lot of people have been tempted uh, by nihilism in the past uh, past year or so. A lot of people have fallen into despair. A lot of people, to use internet slang, have been blackpilled. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you look at the content on my channel, uh, I'm actively fighting against that because I think uh, blackpills are just pretty much uh, pacifiers. Uh, what better thing for the our opponents or the elites than to have their potential opponents just pacified in regards to, oh, nothing I can do will make a difference. Uh, I'm just going to let things happen. I'm just going to let them uh, gain all the, the ground that they want. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, pretty much remaining hopeful, but not just hopeful, uh, remaining determined uh, in these times and rejecting the black pull? Uh, to put it that way. So for me, it goes both personally and then in interactions with others online as I continue to do politics, both online as well as on the ground in person, because I started getting politically involved when I used to live in a major city. I now live in a much more rural conservative area in the United States. So it's been an interesting transition in the last year of going from a uh, minority majority city of El Paso, Texas, uh, right on the border of the United States and Mexico to a now rural sort of backwoods middle America part of the United States. Mm -hmm. But um, what was white pilling us to take internet slang was we've had some really nasty weather where I lived, some freezing pipes, a lot of storm power outages, rolling blackouts. But every one of our neighbors and our family members in the area, we contacted one another People drove to other people's cars, pulled people out of the mud, made sure that they had water, electricity. It was community. It was people meeting at the church, 
distributing food, taking care of one another, making sure they had gas for their generators so they didn't have electricity, and making sure that they could house people who didn't have heat for the night. And to me, I realized that you would never see that in a major metropolitan area, and especially not in El Paso, Texas. In no low trust society, would you say? That? Exactly, a low trust society. And so I realized there in the time that I've now been spending about a year and a half living out in the in the countryside, how important it is to have these small, tight knit communities and having a conversation. Because if you are a stranger to these people, you will forever remain a stranger. If you're willing to go out and shake somebody's hand and have a conversation, whether or not you disagree with that person, but if you get to know them, get to know their name, get to know what they do for a living, their family, odds are that will come back and you know repay itself with significant returns in the long run. And that's been a huge influence on me, just seeing the difference between low trust and high trust society. But on top of that, I mean, personally, I've undergone, um, uh, I've undergone kidney failure. I'm currently on the transplant list. I undergo uh, an at-home dialysis treatment. And despite all of that, I still feel the need to go out and get involved in my local community. I write petitions. I write op-eds in my local newspaper. I, you know, I do this YouTube channel and I have, you know, followings and I talk to people from South Africa to the UK to Russia to Poland. And I think that it's important to let people know that they're not alone, no matter where they live. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's actually something that I've also emphasized on my channel as well. The, the idea of uh, pretty much saving your community don't try to save the world um and you can do it through small things uh you actually mentioned one of the examples that i often use and that is just learn the name of your neighbor uh, learn the name of someone in your street um get involved as on a small scale and then you build from there um, another concept as well that goes hand in hand with that communal idea is also state proofing your life uh, in south africa a good way to state proof your life is to get a legal firearm license because then uh, you're not only dependent, uh, you're not just dependent uh, on the police to pretty much save you. And there are a lot of faults with the South African police, obviously. Um, but yeah, in regards to uh, staying hopeful and uh, not despairing, there is a lot of good around you. There's a lot of uh, a lot of things to be done. I get a lot of uh, satisfaction and meaning from pursuing my calling. And my calling is uh, being pretty much a pioneer uh, in South Africa in regards to solutions for our current problems. But I have a feeling uh, a lot of countries, uh, maybe even the US, are going to start taking notes from uh, in the future, seeing as I think you are, an, are, a, are on a trajectory to experience some of the same problems we have today. So I get a lot of meaning uh, and satisfaction from, the, from knowing that I am a pioneer of ideas and a pioneer of solutions but also that I'm very much uh, involved in my community. And that's something I learned from growing up uh, in a small town in the South African countryside. Um, but it is that idea of community is very important. It's one of the ideas that is increasingly now coming back into the fore. Uh, but it's not surprising seeing it as uh, the vast majority of our history uh, has been built around that idea. I, I agree. If when you look back, it wasn't that people were hyper individualized and looking out for themselves. They looked out for their families. They looked out for their neighbors. They looked out for their communities and by extension, their homeland. And I think only really in the last 60, 70 some odd years did that paradigm shift sort of that market oriented individualism set out for yourself, get out of the house. Don't be around your family, just set up and make your own family and get out of the small town, move to the big city. You see yeah, that in yeah. the popular culture so many times where people will leave their towns and try and make it big in Los Angeles and Hollywood and see what happens in their own adventures and fail to realize what they're missing out on. And, you know, that small town community thing, I think I'm glad that it's coming back into the fore. I think it's going to be important in the future, especially when there are so many things encroaching on day to day life. Uh, I actually had a conversation with one of uh, on a pre with a previous guest uh, on the show, uh, uh on the episode called the, the, the Green Religion, and uh, there he talked about how there is now a worldwide uh, trend for depopulation of the cities. Uh, people are moving towards the the countryside again, and that is something that uh, I'm currently reading a, a book called uh, The Great Betrayal by uh, Ian Smith, the the former leader of Rhodesia. And yeah, yesterday night while I was reading, one of the points that he made was as he grew, uh, when he grew up in the countryside, he realized that uh, the power of community was what gave his life purpose and what gave his life meaning. 
and that's a that's the type of advice that i give people listening to my channel today when you're falling into nihilism when you're falling into meaninglessness there there's a two-pronged solution to getting involved in your community firstly it's going to help improve your community make your community more safe make it more clean make it more stable make it more efficient but secondly, getting involved in your community is going to give you peace of mind. It's going to give you satisfaction. You're going to get meaning from it. In South Africa, a good example, I don't know how popular this idea in the U.S. is, but the idea of neighborhood watches, seeing as it's a very big necessity here in South Africa, getting uh, involved with a neighborhood watch is going to give you something to do. It's going to uh, get you in contact with people in your community. You're going to learn uh, uh, the names of new people. You're going to get to know new people. And that's what community life is about. It's about getting involved on a, a collective sense, not just a hyper individualist sense. You get to talk to people around you. You get to know new people. If you're single and you want to meet someone uh, special in your life, that's how you do it by going to church, by getting involved in all these type of community projects. That's how you meet friends. That's how you meet uh, significant people in your life. And I think it's something that people desperately need to realize. The concept of the neighborhood watch is still something that is around here, more so, I think, in the suburbs than maybe out in the countryside, because out here, most people are armed and can take care of themselves. I'm definitely a person who is uh, armed as well. The old saying, an armed society is a polite society, still has a lot of meaning out in the countryside. But no, being in, but that's the nice thing about that sort of community feel is that you do get to know your neighbors and you do get to meet these special people in your lives, whether that's a potential relationship or lifelong friends. Because, you know, when, when storms happen or where I live, the potential for like tornadoes get to happen, people will open up their storm cellars and shelters and let their neighbors come in. They'll make sure that their livestock is taken care of, that the fencing is still up and help repair things. And I think that people are becoming more and more aware of what the last 60 years of maybe that neoliberal hyper individualized model has done and what it's destroyed. And people are realizing that there's a better way forward. Absolutely. Um, it is something that uh, is very important in regards to the social bonds that you build through these type of community activities. I mean, friendships are built on two uh, ideas. Friendships are built through acts of kindness and friendships are built through suffering, suffering together. I mean, that's why, for example, you get these stories of these incredible stories of friendships from the military, for example, because those oaks suffer together. Um, and that's why you also get these immense uh, stories of great friendships from uh, these types of tightly knit communities, because that's through shared kindness, and through shared assistance to each other. Um, but without that, if you sever those two options, uh, shared suffering and shared kindness, um, and just make it hyper individual, I'm not surprised that people are constantly um, uh, complaining about they can't make friends, they can't meet a uh, significant other or get a, a romantic relationship going. Uh, why are some of the most profound questions of our time uh, being asked of like, where do I meet women? Where do I meet men? Where do I meet friends? How do I make friends? How do I make uh, close friends? Why are my friends uh, not, uh, why are my friendships not as rich as I thought they would be? These are the types of questions that you see constantly on social media. I think you'd get if you type in the first few words of those questions in Google, it would be one of the first suggestions in, for example, the question of how do I make friends? But these are dilemmas of a modern uh, society that has become hyper individualized, where your, your mission in life is to just improve your own personal uh, surroundings and not really care too much about the world around you. I remember I was once in a, a very urban uh, bar uh, in the city. And I remember one of the signs in the bar said, um, tomorrow is overrated. Um, and it just struck me that this is not really a motto you'd hear in the countryside or in a, in a tightly knit community. They tomorrow is incredibly highly rated, seeing as what makes that community function is the fact that they're preparing for the future they're preparing for tomorrow and the best symbol of that would be the planting of a tree i mean there's a reason that the greeks said uh, the civilized great civilizations are built uh, when uh, um, men and women plant trees that uh, they know they'll never sit under i agree and th i think that that's been the, one of the greatest long-standing damage of modernity has been the 
focus immediately on today the sort of hedonistic consumerism that comes with our modern world of well i only need to worry about getting a job and going out every friday night and sort of enjoying myself and not thinking about what my life is going to be 10 15 or 20 years from now i think live fast die young yeah live fast die young or the whole yolo you only live once kind of deal and not thinking about the long-term consequences of your actions especially when the greatest paradigm shift for me in terms of thinking politically in the last year and a half has really been good men and good communities and people who make a real difference strive to live a life knowing at the end of that life their neighbors their family and their friends will all come around whether it's at the casket at the funeral wherever and say that that man lived a good life and to me, if that's something that I can strive for to improve my community just a little bit so that my kids and my grandkids can still enjoy it, then I've done some good in this world. Mm, absolutely. Uh, just before we continue, I see Arman J. Ruiz uh, gave a 35 Rand super chat. Good night, Arman. Thank you for your time. I will be here in a few days on your program. I will be here in a few days for you. Um, and yes, uh, that's, uh, I think something that's very important in regards to people solving their problems is, uh, just get back to being involved in your community. I think that's so important uh, and something that people need to start realizing again. It's not uh, reinventing the route with the wheel. It's rediscovering the wheel. Exactly. We're not, we don't know, there's no need to go out and carve a wheel again. It's, it's been right there for you. You just need to. Yeah. learn how to push it and roll it again absolutely now uh, maybe before we move on to a different topic in regards to the the question of nihilism um do you have any other thoughts that you want to share in regards to i mean we we would be fools not to see the steady creep of, of nihilism into our societies and into our communities and into the many personal lives around us um, do you have any other advice or thoughts in regards to how we stop this or how we fight back against this, uh, this creep of nihilism? It may not necessarily be effective, but something that is reassuring to myself, something that I sort of remind myself to keep on going, is, is that I think about in the popular culture, and as well as throughout history, those famous portraits and stories of, of last stands, so, you know, like the film Zulu, the, the, the Battle of Rourke's Drift, or, you know, in American context, um, Joshua Chamberlain at the Battle of Little Round Top inside of the Battle of Gettysburg. There is something uniquely powerful about a last stand and a final charge, whether the cause is lost or not. And as the American naval commander John Paul Jones said, I have not yet begun to fight. And to me, that is an incredibly powerful attitude to have in regards to nihilism, is that if I can reject that idea that I'm going to be resigned to this terrible world and instead get off my duff and actually do something and carry on with my day and to carry on with my being, then I've succeeded. Because the world that we deal with, the elites and politics and everything that we see, they want you atomized, they want you alone, they want you demoralized and not doing anything. If you, even like how Jordan Peterson is, if you just get out of bed in the morning, make your bed and go about your day, that's one small step in resisting that black pill. And to me, I think that's one of the most important attitudes that we need to adopt, is that every action that we take is a small act of resistance against a incredibly demoralizing and atomizing world. Absolutely. Um... Uh, I just have to, uh, there's someone at the door, so I'm going to ask you just to maybe answer this question while I go answer that. Uh, in terms of these ideas that uh, you're describing here, uh, have you been reading uh, any books recently that uh, have been very fruitful in regards to uh, stimulating you in, uh, in finding new insights regarding these ideas we've uh, discussed uh, tonight so far? Sure. So while you answer your door, I'll go uh, answer that question on terms of that I've been reading. So on my channel, actually, uh, my audience and my little community, they've been picking the books for me to read. Um, and I call it Prudent Reads based off of the title of the channel. And lately I've been reading a variety of books, whether it's um, Hero Worship and the Heroic in History by Thomas Carlyle and understanding the importance of the concept of great men and heroic will being willing to 
go out and fight and change the system, in addition to more contemporary culture war sort of stuff. Um, this Saturday we'll be going over uh, Bronze Age Mindset by the infamous Bronze Age pervert, and that's been an interesting trip in itself, talking about the importance of escape, the importance of community, and getting oneself back to nature, and sort of this rejection of the modern world while taking care of your health. Even if it's written like a bizarre 4chan shitpost, it's definitely entertaining. Um, and then, of course, you know, based off the channel, I've also been rereading the reflections of the Re uh, reflections on the revolutions in France. So those have been some of the more recent reads that I've been taking into account that have been keeping me on track politically. I'm muted. There you, you go. Mentioned <laughs> there the, you mentioned there at the end uh, you're reading a, a book specifically on the French Revolution. I think that's actually uh, an event in history that uh, is changing in regards to how people view it. I think people are viewing it from a uh, completely different angle uh, nowadays, specifically from a conservative or uh, even from a reactionary uh, angle. What are your personal thoughts, seeing as you use uh, some imagery from the French Revolution quite often uh, in your videos? Uh, what are your thoughts in regards to uh, that event specifically? I think that if you want a firm understanding of how we are partially of how we've gotten to where we are, because I'm not a big fan of root cause debate. I think the French Revolution is important for any person who wants to understand our current political situation uh, to study the French Revolution. Um, a lot of the images I use in the title screens of my video are sort of the background as I go into the audio auditory aspect of the video is um, the execution of the Giorndists who were a collection of these moderate pro-monarchy, but we kind of want to reform things that were loosely connected and were eventually executed by the Jacobins. And the reason why I think that that imagery is really important is because there's a lot of people that are sort of politically engulfed now that I think are modern day Giorndists, sort of like the intellectual dark web, your uh, Brett Weinsteins and your Dave Rubens of the world that kind of want to preserve a system that I think is incredibly corrupted but they still think that it can be saved and in turn they will be hoisted by their own petard i mean the whole issue with clubhouse is a good example you've had a lot of intellectual dark web people go on clubhouse to be torn apart by racial woke activists and yet these are the people that they're willing to defend and not recognize the you know importance of the friend enemy distinction so studying the french revolution is incredibly important and it's a to me a very valid comparison to what we're seeing which is this huge social and cultural revolution in the western world mm. uh funny that you should mention that uh, these more classical liberal types uh, uh doing battle with the, the critical race theorists something i really find amusing to see is when they do enter a debate with these critical race theory leftists um the, they'll make a point and then the, the the classical liberal will make a point from his ideological perspective and the critical race theorist will say uh oh i see you're quoting this author he's a white author his, his arguments don't matter anymore these arguments don't carry any weight because of his race and then the the classical liberal's brain will just break he will just pretty much he will not have a response to it seeing as he's being faced with a paradigm or a uh an, a debating toolkit that he's not used to. He's he's fighting against an opponent that's using weaponry that uh, he he doesn't know. He's, the classical liberals have just been so accustomed to these debates where they're debating people that follow their rules, uh, people that follow their rules of debate and rationality, and uh, pretty much follow their f thought process, even though they disagree on their opinions. But throw in a critical race theorist into the mix that just that just tells them. Uh, you're quoting a Western author, your argument is mute, or your argument is invalid, and their brain just stops working. It, it, it's actually, I've seen it happen live. And it, it, indeed, it, it's almost as if it's the inverse of the NPC meme. They just don't understand that they're, you're dealing with someone whose entire worldview rejects the idea of neutrality and colorblindness and they will one by one either learn to combat that by either engaging on their level and in turn no longer being a classical liberal, or they will be, you know, the last man standing in, a, you know, an audio clubhouse discussion full of woke activists, and that's already happening now. 
It's pretty much uh, uh, to use a metaphor. Uh, you're seeing uh, this classical liberal coming into the balance of the battlefield with his sword and his suit of armor, um, and then the the critical race theorist just pulls out a gun and shoots him. He's like, "Well, uh, sorry, man. I, uh, there was no rule. Uh, uh, your rules of combat don't apply here anymore." And that's exactly what it is. Is that you are seeing just almost like the the meiji restoration where the samurai are finally being eliminated by gunpowder and cannons and repeating rifles it's there's no no equitable battlefield here yeah yeah and the the you don't determine the rules anymore i think that's the most important thing <laughs> well and i in others and this is where i think the the, the reactionary sort of critique of you know classical liberalism is rather poignant is that there are no neutral institutions. Individuals will adhere to whatever they were socialized to believe in and whatever, you know, they wish to be in a sort of state of social agreeableness and want to be with what the majority of their peers or what they perceive to be the majority, you know, thinks and believes in. So there's this intense peer pressure for people to act a certain way. And there's the idea that these people can remain neutral is foolhardy at best. Uh, I see here one of my friends, uh, Odin Moja, says, uh, major I restoration, man, this guy knows his stuff. <laughs> well, I have a degree in history, so I'd hope so. <laughs> mm, well, that's excellent. But I remember uh, learning about it when I was in university as well. Um, yeah, but I think that is, and I think it, it wasn't a topic I planned to talk about, but it has pretty much been very prominent, and that is the, the culture war has changed. Uh, war never changes, but uh, the, the tactics on the battlefield do change, and the, the, the weapons that are used do change. And uh, it seems like if you take the 2013 or 2012 to 2015 or 2012 to 2016 uh, culture war period, uh, that's pretty much uh, swords and shields. And then you take the, the period between 2016 and 2021, and it's just the, the gunpowder revolution. People start using uh, different types of weaponry. Uh, it, it's almost as if, I don't, you're, you being a student of history, you probably know the transition from the, the old way of doing warfare, where it's almost like a duel. You, you show mercy to your opponents. They're very strict rules that you and your opponents adhere to. Um, and then you pretty much get this revolution. I don't know when exactly it happened, but somewhere, I think, in the, the 19th century, um, where rules just, the idea of total war, well, it's actually introduced by Napoleon, so it's earlier. The idea of total war, no mercy, no taking prisoners, um, kill off and destroy your opponent at all costs. Um, that's almost what we're seeing happen with the culture war now, is where the previous incarnation was pretty much akin to you get two debaters approaching each other and they have a debate. Um, and then the, the debater destroys his opponent and he gets a, a nice viral YouTube video and everyone cheers. But today, uh, the rules of war have changed. Uh, the rules of the culture war have changed. There's no longer that civil element. There's no longer that uh, duel between ideas, the battle of ideas to even take a term from the classical liberals. Uh, it's now just total war. It's now just take no prisoners, destroy your opponent if you have to. It's pretty much, to really put it in perspective, it's pretty much Sol Alinsky uh, rules for radicals uh, gone full circle now. And historically, I would argue that we're in that position where European powers are realizing that we're up against Napoleon and that this is going to be total warfare. Although what comparative in strategy is that people on our side of things, I feel very much like it is the North American theater of the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian Wars, it's also known here in the United States, is that you sort of have these sporadic conflicts of different fronts in a guerrilla-style conflict because we are not as organized as we need to be. And that's uh, why we need people more like you to organize and to get people involved on the local level. And um, as we come to terms with this, there's been a conversation on the political right about the need for an activist organized, you know, political class that can get people engaged both on the ground and online. Because if, you know, the right politically in the culture war had an army of, say, people like Jack Posobiec on Twitter 24-7, seven days a week, like the same way that the left does, 
there would be significant improvements in messaging and getting, you know, people out to where we need to, but we don't have that. And that's why I think it's important for us to wake up and realize that the, the culture war has changed. It is a total kind of conflict and you need every man, woman, and child involved in some way in form or fashion, because if not, it will be annihilation. And that's the thing is that uh, we have far gone from the time where it was just uh, the worst consequence you could suffer from losing a debate uh, was pretty much you get uh, humiliated on the internet or in public. Now we are at the point where it's no longer just destroyed compilations. It's getting unpersoned. It's getting uh, losing your job. It's being destroyed. That's where the, the, the culture war has escalated to, where people are losing their jobs, people are losing their friends, people are losing uh, many important things in their lives because they're being deliberately targeted by people, the ideologically possessed, as I call them. Um, and uh, this is where we are now. It's uh, no longer just a battle of ideas. Uh, a battle of ideas uh, is a very idealistic way of looking at it. Um, and uh, again, uh, I don't think uh, we are in, it's no longer the, the realm of facts don't care about your feelings. Uh, to be very frank with you, sometimes feelings beat the shit out of your facts. They do. And those feelings will then cause people to act in ways to deperson, to dox, and to get people fired. I had noticed in the chat earlier, someone had asked, why am I not showing my face? And it's the same reason why so many other commentators don't show their faces. Heaven forbid that someone you know has it out for you and they want to go out of their way to inform their employer that oh there you have this terrible right winger in your ranks and you need to have them fired and we've seen other commentators like that i know academic agent had been doxxed and had lost his job because someone went after him so it is incredibly important that people do what they can to take care of themselves but at the same time yeah feelings will beat the shit out of those you know the facts but people need to learn how to both weaponize feelings as much as they can weaponize facts to defend themselves and their families and community. Mm. Well, uh, yes, uh, in, in that regard, uh, I definitely agree. But then also, um, I think the, the conservative tradition has always been uh, blessed with a rich vein of uh, feeling and emotion within it as well. It's the internet. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, I don't know where I cut off. Uh, did we get to the JFK example? I d if you made a JFK example, I certainly didn't hear it. So if you, you want to go again. Uh, mm. All right. Now, it's very simple. Uh, what I said is uh, this whole facts don't care about your feelings just does go against a lot of the, the basic tenets of conservative thought and uh, against the human experience. I mean, to use the example of JFK and the, the, the landing on the moon. Um, his speech is not, uh, look at what our scientists have achieved, look at what science has achieved. This is a, an achievement for science. No, it's an achievement of the nation. It's an achievement for the USA. It's a very much emotionally rich uh, speech that he does. It's not something that's just cold and sterile uh, in regards to this. The facts have won, the, the science has won. It's rather we have overcome, we as a community, we as a nation. Um, and I think if we disregard uh, that whole uh, uh, emotional and uh, feeling element of uh, human nature and just go towards the pure facts, pure hard-hitting numbers and statistics side, you're not going to win a lot of hearts and minds. People are just going to uh, move away from you because you're not going to appear fully human to them. You're just going to resemble a robot or a chatbot that's trying to replicate being a, a political thinker. I, I wholeheartedly agree, and I think that's something that the right has made a mistake on, and I think that that, unfortunately, is a lot to do with, you know, the Ben Shapiro meme of facts don't care about your feelings, but the right, and this is something I've said in my videos and in conversations with other creators, is that it is important for you to be a paragon of virtue in your community. You have to be an emotional being. You have to be someone who is involved. It's, in, it's not enough to just be the guy with the right facts or the right ideas or the right understanding of economics. You have to have an appreciation of aesthetics, an appreciation of art, an appreciation of community and nature and appreciating the great outdoors and those, you know, the neighborhood and community around you. Because if you don't have the emotional spirit to care about you know, your homeland or your community or your home or your person, you're not going to be winning anybody over to your cause you're not going to be winning anybody over to the ideology that you uh, ascribe to. And that's why I tell people that if you really want to win, 
you'll spend, you know, 30 minutes less on Twitter and 30 minutes more, say, you know, going to your parent teacher conferences for your kids or letting your neighbor know that you can watch the dog over the weekend while they're on vacation. Those kind of things make you a leader in your community and make you someone that people can look up to. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a very strong uh, thought to actually end it on before, uh, I think, in regards to the, the previous topic. Um, the Prudentialist, thank you very much uh, for this excellent discussion so far. I'm going to have to have you on back in the future to continue this. But maybe before we uh, say goodbye, um, what are your final thoughts in regards to the themes and ideas that uh, we discussed tonight? Well, as the title of the stream is talking about, is the triumph of good and evil. And I, I, I've always been a fan of the phrase, despite the, the muddy politics of Martin Luther King Jr., is that, you know, evil wins when good men sit by and do nothing. And, and I'm sure that quote even goes back to even further into the past as well. But action is essential. And I've always said in, on my streams and videos that the biggest difference between a young person on the right and a young person on the left is that the young person on the left is willing to go out and knock on doors for their favorite socialist Bernie Sanders type candidate. Whereas a person on the right is more likely to talk online and shit post on Twitter. We as young people on the right need to follow more of your example and be actually engaged, create organizations and communities to go forward. And I will do it locally. I've done it in my youth and I've done it now and I'll continue to do so. And I think that I will recommend more people to look at the work that you and the other people of Afri Forum do because this is the shining example. And when more and more people in the United States talk about South Africa as an example of democratic politics, then we're going to need a lot more people like you in the U.S. in the future. <laughs> All right. Uh, but, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming on. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, sorry about the, the Internet issues at the end. Uh, that's just uh, the reality of streaming live. Um, but, yeah, it was. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. I will definitely have you on in the future. And also, uh, thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. If you liked the ideas that were discussed here tonight, uh, you can – and some of the, the ideas specifically coming from the Prudentialist. There's a link to his YouTube channel in the description. I highly recommend it. Go subscribe, go check it out. He's uh, fast approaching a thousand subscribers. Let's help him out. And uh, if you're new to my channel uh, and you enjoyed this type of discussion, you can also subscribe here for future discussions of this quality. Uh, so thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. The Prudentialist, thank you very much for your valuable time. And we will chat again real soon. Cheers, guys. Have a good one and God bless. Take care, guys. Thank you so much.